Well, good morning, and welcome to Check Connect Church Lawrence. We're really glad that you're here. You know, I found out about that, and I felt like calling them and saying, hey, uh, but I thought, no, we're building the kingdom, so we'll just bless them as well. Um, so if, you, if you've been around here for a while, or more than probably three weeks, uh, you know that I have a great affection for my daughters. And if you haven't been, well, you'll, if, you, if you don't know that, well, now you know. And uh, I, I love my girls, and um, I'm so grateful for the women they have become, the men they have married, and the grandchildren that they brought into my life. And, but, but a real reason... A real part of that sort of connection to my daughters goes back to their childhood, right? And as parents, we all understand that being a parent is full of great and incredible moments interrupted by long periods of really difficult, challenging time, right? I mean, bedtime and, and cha- you know, when they become teenagers, wake, waiting up for them and praying over them. But as parents, that sort of the, sort of the reward, or for me at least, uh, those moments where you just have those parent moments where you're just like, wow, this is what it's all about. And probably the, I would say, one of the highlights of those moments, one of the things that I still think about on a regular basis was when my Chelsea was seven and my Jamie was five and my Kylie was a newborn. And it's really easy for me to remember this event because Kylie was in one of those, you know, front packs, those papoose things that you wear. And I was carrying her and we were in Colorado at a pastor's retreat. So I remember Kylie was a newborn, and I know this pastor retreat was in September, and I, I know Chelsea and Jamie were five and seven when Kylie was born. So I remember we, we headed out one day uh, at this retreat, and we decided we were going to explore a little bit up on what they call Rainbow Trail, if you're familiar with Salida, near Salida, Colorado. And we were on Rainbow Trail, and this is a, an easy trail. It kind of goes along the side of the mountain. It doesn't, there's, there's some up and down, but there's no real elevation gain. And so we climbed up to Prime, uh, Rainbow Trail. We hiked along it for a while. We found the stream. We sort of walked up, and the girls were just loving it. Just love being in the mountains. And then we saw a trailhead that went up to some lakes. And I said to Janet, I said, let's just, let's just head up that trail. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I'd really like to get my family all the way up to those lakes, but I didn't tell Janet or the girls, let's just head up that trail. And so we began to head up that trail, and, and you know, the elevation gain is now starting to become a real thing. But my girls are troopers. They love being in the mountains, and they're just hiking away. And Chelsea's taking the lead, and Kylie, Jamie's dragging behind a little bit. She's a little bit younger, but they keep going, they keep going. And we get, and I had gone up this trail before, so I knew that, I knew kind of where we were. And I realized that we were over halfway up to the lakes. And and I said to them, hey, girls, there's these beautiful lakes up there. Let's try to make it. And they sort of embraced that challenge, and we kept hiking and kept hiking, and and pretty soon, uh, Chelsea, you know, Chelsea would go, we'd have, Chelsea, come back. There might, you know, don't get too far ahead. And Kylie, Jamie was starting to sort of, eh, you know, I'm not sure I want to do this. And, and Kylie was just sleeping, in my, you know. And so we get a little bit closer, a little bit closer, and then, and, and then Jamie's done. But I say, no, we're not done. We've come too far. I said, Jamie, let me tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. You walk 100 steps, and then I'll put you on my shoulders, and I'll walk 100 steps, Okay. And she said, okay. So she walked 100 steps, and I did that. And then she'd go a little wired. She said, I'm done. I said, let's do it. Make another day. So we did that about five times. And so for like 500 steps up a mountain, I have Kylie, and I have Jamie, and I'm going up this mountain. And, you know, I'm a big guy. I'm played, you know, you can see how easy this would have been for me. <laughs> and anyway, we make it to this. We make it almost to the top. And, again, I had been up there before, and I knew if we just made it up this one little it's very steep, but if we make up this one, you can just, it's like 100 yards, but as Chris, you know, back and forth, we'd see the lakes. And so Jamie was done. So Janet said, I'll just stay here with Jamie. So Chelsea and I and Kylie went, oh, well, I left Kylie with uh, Jamie at that, uh, Janet at that point. We went on up and we saw the lakes. And Chelsea was like, Daddy, this is awesome. And I said, I know. And I yelled back, Jamie, this is awesome. Chelsea wants you to come up here. And, we, and, and I went back and I got them and Chelsea stayed. Anyway, we got all the way to the top. I just remember standing at the top of those mountains, at that, at that lake. And if you've ever been to a high mountain lake, you know what I'm talking about. Just absolute beauty. The waterfall coming out of the lake, the mountains surrounding us, the snow still melting into the lake. And I just remember standing there. And, and by the way, one thing I didn't tell them is it's harder going down than it is coming up on your knees. <laughs> like you never tell anybody that's climbed the mountain for the first time the truth of that. But uh, they figured that out later. So that's another story. But 
just as I was, I was standing up there with my, 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 with my kids, I just had this extremely deep, meaningful moment. Like, I just remember being so proud of my girls for being such great troopers. And so, it was just this, this incredible moment. At the end of the sermon, I'll tell you why that matters. But I want you to try to grasp that feeling of that moment for me. And I want you to think about what that moment cost me, what it cost the girls, and yet what we experienced, all right? We'll come back to that later. But for now, I want to remind you that the wisest man on the planet, King Solomon, proclaimed that everything is meaningless. You saw the bumper video if you've been here over the last couple of weeks, if you've ever read the book of Ecclesiastes, which we're looking at. You know that one of the main messages in the book of Ecclesiastes is this repeated message over and over again. Everything is meaningless. Everything is meaningless. In fact, right out of the gate in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, he says it this way. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? 33 times the phrase meaningless is used by the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes, which was written either by Solomon or about King Solomon. This man who had everything, wisdom, wealth, power, pleasure, he had it all, and yet he found that all of it was meaningless. Now, as we've explored this book and uncovered it a little bit, and, and some of you have been reading, and in fact, I've gotten some of you giving me feedback on what I should be talking about. I love it when you do that, by the way, because I know you're engaging in the text. Uh, we, we discover if you read the book of Ecclesiastes that there's large chunks of the book that give really good wisdom. It sounds a little bit like Proverbs in some of the book of Ecclesiastes. And, and Solomon would tell us that, that there are things under the sun, there are things in this world that have meaning, that, that have value. There are some things that are more important than other things. Wisdom is better than, seeking wisdom is better than seeking pleasure. But he, so he, he does not say that there's no value to everything under the sun. He doesn't say that there's not, a, and he kind of delineates these things are more valuable than those things. So he's not, he's not suggesting that everything under the sun is uh, of equal value, but he is saying that not anything under the sun is of ultimate value. Like even those moments with my kids, right? Even those greatest moments you've ever experienced, there's still something in them that is not quite completely filling our hearts. And so what we've been saying in this series is, in short, is that without Jesus, our lives are meaningless. And, that, and that's kind of, a, it's kind of a bold statement. I do not mean by that that without Jesus, our lives don't have some meaning. I am not suggesting that people who don't embrace the faith of Christ like we do can't have great moments of meaning in their life or find value in their life or find, find opportunities to sort of experience something that brings fulfillment to them. I know that is true. I see it. I, 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 I've, I've seen people talk about how, you know, when you serve somebody, no matter what your faith base, base is, there's meaning in that. When you have a good marriage, there's meaning in that. When you have a good relationship with your kids, there's meaning in that. When you're generous to others, there's meaning in that. But at the end of the day, I think what Solomon would say is that there, there's, there's a moment where that is not ultimately meaningful. That there's always somebody else who needs help. That every good moment with our child, there's t- 10 others that are challenging, <laughs> For every good deed we do, there's many left undone. Even, and, and even, the, right, have you ever done something really good and then it's not accepted or it's not appreciated? So even in our meaningful moments, even in our, our good things, there's, there's a gap. So there's nothing under the sun, I think Solomon would say, that is ultimate value. There's some that have meaning, but nothing that's ultimate value. Because in the end, without the revelation of God to humanity by way of Jesus... I know just, we just rattle that off, but this, this is what the Christian faith is. We believe that God revealed himself, that he showed himself, that he opened himself up for us to know him. And he did that by sending Jesus, because Jesus himself said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, I want you to know me. God said, we would not know him otherwise. He revealed himself. And without that revelation of Jesus, everything that we experience under, under, under the sun is ultimately meaningless, does not give us ultimate meaning. The first week, we talked about this idea, and, and, we, and we realized that Jesus gives meaning even to tough things. Remember, if you were here the first week, I compared Corey Ten Boom, who survived a concentration camp and found great meaning in suffering, to the king of Bavaria, who, who couldn't find meaning, even though he built castle after castle after castle. 
And so the discovery there was that Jesus brings value and meaning to suffering, but, but King Ludwig couldn't find value and meaning no matter how much he built for himself. And last week we talked about this idea that Jesus died at just the right time to bring meaning to every one of our moments, that he, he redeems the time. That Jesus can take, the, and remember last week, Ecclesiastes 3, there's a time for death, and there's a time for life, there's a time for grieving, there's a time for laughter. And, there, and all those moments we discovered last week that Jesus brings meaning to them. And this morning, I want us to understand that Jesus gives us a clear direction in life. That Jesus gives us a clear direction in life. That at the end of the day, we all kind of want to know, what am I supposed to be doing? How am I supposed to be living? Why am I on this planet? Yeah, we, we have jobs, we, we're, we're parents, we're students, we're children, but, but ultimately, what am I supposed to be about? I believe we'll discover this morning that Jesus gives us clear direction. There's a, there's a researcher by the name of Christian Smith, and this is a little bit of, this, this research is a little bit dated, I understand that, but I think it's still relevant. And many of you have probably heard of his research when I began to explain it. He sort of he sort of looked at the church and through surveys began to try to figure out what do people believe? What do, what do people in churches really believe? And he, he concluded that the, 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 the belief system of many that occupy the churches in America, this is focused on American church, he, he, he called it moralistic, therapeutic deism. Okay, I want, I want to talk about each one of those. So, so that he said that most, many people in churches sort of have a belief system that's filtered through God is moralistic, therapeutic, and deistic. Moralistic meaning that our job is to be good. We're, we're to be moral. We're, we're to figure out what, that, that Christians are supposed to be good. That's, that's our job. And then secondly, that we're, we're supposed to be happy. You know, therapeutic. We're supposed to be happy. Life is supposed to make sense. God is, God is, there. God is there to help me be happy. And then deistic his research showed that while people say they believe in God, most of them have a view of God that is this. God is there, he's distant, and I really only, he really only intersects my life when I need him. Like, he doesn't inform my daily decisions, he doesn't inform my ethics, really. He's just kind of there, I believe in him, and when I need him, I expect him to be at my beck and call. And, and as I thought about Christian Smith's research, and, and I, 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 there's a lot of, like, listen for that, and I, I'm not going to pick on, I'm going to be really careful here what I'm about to say, but listen for that in the Christian ghetto. Okay, you know what I mean when I say the Christian ghetto? So, so the world of Christians, and, and I'm, not, I'm not picking on Christian radio per se, I'm not picking on other churches per se, I'm, I, you, listen for it here when you come here. Listen for that idea that for Christians, our job is, here's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be good, God wants us to be happy, and, and God doesn't really inform the daily decisions of my life. I believe in him, but he really doesn't change. I like, at the end of the day, I'm not a whole lot different than those who don't believe in him in terms of how I make my lifestyle choices, how I make my money choices, my sexual ethics, my politics. It, God is there, but he's not really integrated into my life. I think Christian Smith is right. I think this view of God then allows us divine, the, to define what is good. So we begin to change what is good and what is bad based on what culture tells us, what social media is saying, what we're learning in school, and whatever. Then we expect God to make us happy, and we have God on speed dial when I want him, but otherwise he's not really involved in the daily decisions of my life. And I think, I think that Christian Smith research strikes a chord. I don't know how many of you have ever listened to or watched a video on social media by John Christ. Anybody know who John Christ is? He's, uh, if you know, you Google him, he's hilarious. He's a little sacrilegious at times. He makes me uncomfortable at times, but it, that means he's a good comedian, right? So, and he sort of makes fun of the church. And what he makes fun of the church is often is when the church works really, really hard to be relevant, but comes across then as irrelevant or sappy. And, and, and really he comes across, the church then oftentimes comes across as not preaching the gospel. And John Christ was, he got a little bit more serious on this one video I watched. He, he talked about the fact his dad was a pastor. And so he said, I grew up in the church. I understand the church. And he said, he said oftentimes the church will do everything it can to make itself relevant. And he starts talking about, you know, uh, a church that like drops ping pong balls from a helicopter, you know, and, and, and tons of people come and, and they get prizes if they get the right ping pong balls. As long as I'm not dropping turkeys, I guess, okay. <laughs> Did you get that reference? Okay. 
You're in the old people's club if you got that reverence. But, but John Chris said, here's what he said. Here's what he said. Churches do this stuff because when they do this stuff, people show up. He said, he said the reason churches keep doing stuff to kind of expand and, and market and, and do all this stuff to get people in the doors is because when we do it, people show up. And he said, if churches really preach the gospel, they might empty out. So pastors and leaders have this tension, and trust me, I recognize this tension, of trying to say, I want to stay true to the word, and yet if I stay too true to the word, what's going to happen to my congregation? What's going to happen to the budget? Now, John Christ was kind of defending churches and pastors, kind of putting the blame with the congregations. I want to defend the congregation and say, we're all a part of this problem. <laughs> Which came first to church's marketing strategies or the people's response to it? I don't know. Go home and debate that at lunch. It doesn't matter to me. I think we have this thing in the church. And again, and you, you may be sitting there saying, yeah, I've been noticing that at Connect Church. I'm glad you brought this up. It's a constant tension for us. How do we be relevant? Listen, listen to me. If you, were to be a, if you were to be a missionary coming to America, you would be coming into a consumeristic culture, Right? And a good missionary understands this. They have to take the gospel to the culture they're in. But they've got to take the gospel to the culture they're in, not something different than the gospel. Okay, I'm getting a little off on church talk here, but I think you understand that tension. You understand where the church is right now. We're, we're, and so Smith surmises, after all this research, here's what he surmises. He surmises, this is why people are leaving the church. Because if the goal is to be good, when we're not good, we feel bad. When the, if the goal is to be happy when we're not happy, then we wonder what's wrong with the church and this isn't working for me. And if, and if, if the church, if, if Jesus is deistic and way far away, and then when we talk, start talking about him being intimate and involving the, and the decisions of our lives and, and that Christ should be shaping our morals and ethics, then that becomes offensive and we, and we leave the church. Because what we're, and, 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 and Christian Smith's research basically at the end of the day is that the church needs to get back to making sure we understand the gospel. And, and, here, and as I read the research, I kept thinking, Christian Smith is defining Ecclesiastes. Think about it. Go back and read the book of me, Ecclesiastes. And, and, and Ecclesiastes is trying to determine what is good, what is good, what is good, what is good. I want to be happy. I want to be happy. This is meaningless because it's not filling something in me. And God seems distant. Go back and read it. He's wondering, where is God in all this? So this idea of moralistic therapeutic deism has been what's the challenge of every human heart. Here's what I want to say this morning. That's the problem. You want to know the good news? You should say yes now. Thank you. Because I, I don't want to give you the good news unless you really want it. Here's the good news. The cross cuts through all of this. The cross cuts through all of this. Beyond moralism, the cross exposes our sin, right? The cross says there's something broken in you. There's something wrong in you. And that's why Jesus came. He didn't come just to give us a good example. He, the cross is powerful because it shouts out, you're broken, you're sinful, that you, you can try as much as you want. But at the end of the day, and, and listen, you should try to be moral. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> Don't go out there. Pastor says I, I should go and be as immoral as possible so I understand my own sin. No, that's not the message. But we understand, right? The gospel's message is no matter how good we try to be, there's still something inside of us that's broken. And, and the cross says beyond therapy, I, I want to give you life. I believe in therapy. I believe that there's an incredible value in having somebody help you think through how you're handling your emotions and your stress in life. And if you're seeing a therapist or you are a therapist or you're going to counseling, join the club. It's awesome. But at the end of the day, therapy can only take us so far. What we need is new life. And the cross says, look, I have come to do something that no matter how much you talk through your issues, I can give you. And that is life. And the cross, man, the cross just... The cross destroys deism. God's not up there somewhere that is only accessible on occasion. He is here. And when I talk about the cross, you know, you know me and my preaching. I talk about the cross event. Not just the, not just the cross when Jesus died that day, but the cross event. The incarnation where he became born, the life, the teachings of Jesus, the death on the cross, the resurrection, the sending of the Holy Spirit, and the formation of the church. That's the cross. 
And, and, and that event tells us that God is here historically, and he's here experientially through the Holy Spirit. He's not deistic. He's not afar off there somewhere looking down on us and making us feel guilty. He's here. In the end, what the cross really does is deals with our shame. Moralistic therapeutic deism can never deal with your shame. You can never figure out what good really is. And if you did, you can't live up to it. You can never be happy enough just by figuring out your emotions. It's helpful to do that, but you can never fully figure that out on your own. Only eternal life can do that. And God wants to be very near and intimate to you even when you feel like you have done the worst thing possible. And I'm not just talking. This is what the Bible says. Listen to Colossians chapter 2. I love how it starts. We talked about this last week in the right time. When you were dead in your sins. See, moralistic therapeutic deism doesn't allow us to be dead in our sins. Moralistic therapeutic deism says, figure out good on your own. Make sure God makes you happy. And the cross message is when you were dead in your sins. And in the uncircumcision of your flesh, it's in that moment when you feel the most far from him that God made you alive with Christ. Let this next phrase sink in. He forgave us all our sins. Some of you are still thinking about things you've done a long time ago. Maybe you're living with the consequences of those choices. And that's another subject. But you do not have to live with the condemnation of those choices. He forgave all our sins. Amen? Yeah. Moralistic therapeutic deism can't do that for you. He canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. Not only to forgive our sins, but he made us, you know, we're no longer indebted to those sins, to God. He, it's, those, those, things, those sins stood against us and they condemned us. He has taken it away. He nailed it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. So, so all that stuff you're carrying, all that morality you're trying to, to show off to everybody, all that happiness you're seeking is found by bringing all that to the cross, confessing it, and leaving it there so he can nail it to the cross and forgive you of your sin. The cross does what moralistic therapeutic deism could never do, it deals with our shame. And we love as we should that part of the message of the cross. I'm setting you up, y'all. Because there's another part of the cross that we tend to not be so grateful for. But I want to make a case. It's just as freeing as the shame-bearing cross. And that is the the life direction giving cross. The cross provides a clear direction for our life. And it was Jesus that said this in Luke chapter 9. Then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, who wants to be the follower of Jesus, right? All of us. Then just come to church, do the best you can. Make sure your sins are forgiven. Hang on till you get to heaven. Listen to what he says. You must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. And we read those words, and even how I read them, I read them so like morose, so like, take up your cross. You know what? I think Jesus wanted us to hear those words as freedom. Hey, guys, here's how you figure out life. Here's the way. To figure out life. Lay down your life. Pick up my cross and follow me. In fact, he goes on to say it. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. You see, if we want the cross to deal with our shame, and who doesn't, then we also need to allow it to be the guiding ethic of our lives. It, it is both. 
It is freedom from past sin and clarity about what to do next and what to do next week and what to do next month and what to do next year and how to deal with this issue and how to deal with that issue is laying down my way, picking up the cross and walking in. Here's a, it's, it's, it's a dirty word in, the ch- in some churches, but it's the most freeing word of all. And walk in obedience. See, we have this idea about obedience that somehow if we talk about obedience too much, people will think that we have to become obedient before Jesus will love us. Have I established the fact that the cross is all we need, that he starts there, he came down? Like, like It removes our shame. But people who really understand the cross understand that it now becomes the guiding principle of how I live my life. It's what informs my ethics. It what, it's what informs my decisions about how to live my life on a daily basis. And it frees us. It clarifies life for us. I know this is a cheesy illustration, but it's, it's really the GPS of our life. It's, it's turn left. Have you, ever, have you ever gone against your GPS? Please proceed and make a U-turn as soon as possible. <laughs> and the cross is kind of this... This, please make a U-turn as soon as possible. And it's just, just a, it's just this guiding reality and this guiding principle that my role in life is to lay down my life, pick up the cross, and follow him. And that's the pathway. Not only, that's the pathway to life. Like we've been given this life through what Christ did historically. But now there's this new way he wants us to walk and a new way he wants us to live. So, so let's just break these down. Give up your own way to trust that GPS voice. You see, I, I struggle with my GPS. Uh, I plugged it. I plugged it. We're going to Kansas City, and I have a, a car that I, I just refuse to update the GPS. You know, you have to download it. I'm not paying for that because I've got it on my phone. But I thought, well, I'll try it on my car. And, and so <clears throat> we went out on K10. And uh, we went out on the new K10 that's not on the GPS yet. And it just freaked it out. It didn't know what to do. I felt like at some point it was going to say, you are now driving through a cornfield. But it never did say that. <laughs> and so and I've, I've followed my GPS before. And it's like, it, especially if I kind of know the area like Kansas City, like I can get anywhere in Kansas City without a GPS. It just might take me a little while, right? Like I can eventually get there. Um, And so when I'm driving and I think I know better than the GPS, I'll do what I want to do. And then it'll, and then it'll, and then I'll realize I'm learning like the ones that are updated actually, like they know what they're talking about. They know what, you know what they also know? They know where construction is. They know where the traffic is. And I'm just learning that if I will just be humble enough to listen to the little, in my case, it's an English dude, you know, and then I'll get there. Again. Cheesy illustration, but give up your own way. Recognize that while you kind of know how to navigate your life, there's maybe some road construction or roadblocks ahead that the cross will allow you to avoid. We turn from our own way and turn towards God's way. That's repentance. Bill Hull says the trouble with our evangelism is that we have made it so easy to enter the Christian life that we miss the repentance, commitment, and regeneration that provide the power to live the Christian life. In other words, we miss the second half of the story of the cross. Take up your, uh, lay down your life. And then take up your cross. What does it mean to take up your cross? See, it's not just turning from my way. It's also embracing the cross way. Here's two things that taking up your cross is not. Taking up your cross is not carrying a burden. You hear this all the time, right? Well, I guess this is just my cross that I have to bear. We, we talk about that in terms of our sickness or our illness or our struggles, our financial burdens. We'll say, and, and let me tell you something, that's difficult. You're bearing something, but that's just a burden. Galatians talks about burdens. Job had burdens. All around scripture, you see this idea that there's stuff that's thrust upon us. See, there's no choice in that, right? That's just stuff that happens to you. Now, God can help you through that, and God has grace for you in that, but that's not your cross. You don't take that up. That was put upon you. You see the difference? Taking up your cross is not just, well, I've got I've to carry this burden. Paul talked about it as a thorn in the flesh, something that God gave him. To just, it was just there. It was, it, it's on him. I, we, there's a whole series in theology and conversation about where that stuff comes from and all of that, but that's not your cross. Here's, here's something else that's not your cross. 
Some of you say, oh, I just have a temper. That's the cross I have to bear. No, that's the sin you have. That's not your cross. The cross is your intentional decision to embrace the suffering and the humility that the cross brings. It's our choice to identify with the one who identified with us. It leads us to tough choices and painful decisions that then bloom into newness of life. It's the choice to forgive somebody who doesn't deserve to be forgiven. It's the choice to consider our sex life in light of what God wants, not what society says. It's the choice to ask the question, how is Christ going to inform my politics? And I'm not going to answer that for you, but if Christ is not informing your politics, perhaps you haven't picked up your cross. And, 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 and I'm going to tell you, whichever party you're in or ideology you embrace, the cross will challenge it. I promise you. It's a choice to identify with Christ. Thomas A. Kempis says, if you bear the cross cheerfully, it will bear you. And if we pick up the cross, it will guide our path. And he says to do it daily. And then finally, lay down your life, pick up the cross and follow me. We've settled for a confessional faith, not an obedient one. Confessing Christ is important. Romans talks about that. If you confess with mouth Jesus, Lord, you'll be saved. We, confession matters. Theology matters. What we believe matters. If you've heard me preach, you know I believe that to my core. But that's not, Jesus didn't say, come confess me. He said, come follow me. He didn't say to the disciples by the seashore, listen, if y'all just confess that I'm Lord, y'all can stay there and just keep doing that. Just keep fishing. I'm going to go over here and do this thing. What did he say? He said, no, y'all, I'm sorry, I don't, I'm from Oklahoma. This, the y'all's coming out today. <laughs> you, gentlemen, you come and follow me. That's what being a disciple is. It's not about confessing something or knowing something. It's about doing something. Follow me. Anyone who truly understands grace knows that obedience is the fruit of grace, not the enemy of it. Obedience is the fruit of grace, not the enemy of it. And the promise is when you open up, when you give up, when you, take up your, when you give up your life and take up the cross and follow, that's when you find your best life. Did you see it in the passage? If you try to hold on to your life, you're going to lose it. But man, if you'll embrace the cross, you're going to find your life. So the church needs to stop preaching and living more or less like therapeutic deism and invite people to the cross. It's a, it's a hard invitation. It will cost you something but it'll give you moments with God that are not possible any other way. So here's a tie back to my mountain story with my girls. You know what that sacrifice was for me? You know what? I gave up a lot for that. I was sore for days. But I did not regret it for a moment. I did not regret it for a moment. Taking up your cross and following Jesus will not always feel good, but it will lead you to places you can never get to otherwise. Do you hear that? So if you've heard condemnation and heavy weight and, oh, I've got to obey now because of preacher, then I'm not communicating well or you're not listening well. I'm challenging you. I'm encouraging you. I'm calling you to the hard choices in life that will lead you to beautiful places that you can never get to otherwise. So I'm asking you this morning, what is it that you need to lay down? What is it that Christ is asking you to pick up? How is he asking you to identify with the cross what does it mean for you this morning to take up the cross in your life I can't answer that for you we're going to give you a chance to contemplate that though as we take communion this morning the worship team is going to come and we're going to sing one more song and as we, as we sing this last song we're going to invite you to the, to the altars or to the tables here for communion at, at Connect Church, we believe in open communion. That means you don't need to be a member of our church to participate. This is, a, this is a sacrament and a time for those who have embraced the cross, who have said, I'm trusting that story. And some of you are like, well, I've got a long way to go. That's fine. We all have a long way to go. This is a, this is a confession. This is a statement. Maybe this is an act of obedience even to come forward and say, you know what? I'm trusting what Jesus did will set me. I'm trusting that he will forgive all my sins. I'm trusting he will nail it to the cross. And communion is also a time where we say, and I'm coming to walk the path of the cross myself. I'm not perfect. I'm far from getting it figured out, but I'm embracing this message. So if that's you, 
whether you're a member of our church or not, we invite you. If you don't want to come for communion for whatever reason, and there could be a multitude of reasons, that is perfectly fine. A couple of logistical notes. We have tried every time we've done communion to figure out how to make this smooth and easy, and I've decided I'm giving up on that. <laughs> Two reasons. Number one, it's too hard to figure out with this funky aisles we have here. And number two, the cross brings us together. And sometimes it's messy and sloppy and weird and awkward, but that's the body of Christ. I mean, everybody else is wet, messy and sloppy and weird and awkward. Not you, but us, right? So if we bump into each other and trip over each other to try to figure our way how to get up here, I think there's actually some symbolism in that. One idea is to kind of come down the middle and go on the outside, but if that doesn't work, you do whatever you want to do. The other thing I would say is we do have gluten-free options here in these middle ones now. If that's helpful to you, you'll want to come to these two middle ones right here. The, but there are four elements on the sides, and two on each side. We invite you to come. Here's what we're doing. We're remembering what the cross has done for us and how our sins are forgiven. And we're saying, in this moment, I want to embrace that as my lifestyle. I want to, be, I want to continue or begin listening to the cross as the GPS of my life to direct my choices, my morals, all those things. So Lord, help us to embrace and remember the message of the cross as we participate in this wonderful act of communion. Amen. One more thing. When you receive the elements, you may take them back to your seat and take them at your own time. Pastor Ben will dismiss us after the song is finished. You are welcome to come. <coughs>